So um, welcome, everybody. This is our first um, meeting back after a, a cessation of a couple of weeks where um, I think people took a break. I took a little beginning of the summer break, so that was nice. Um, what we're doing today is effect size. Um, next week, Matt Butler is going to talk to us about some um, some computer vision research he's been doing with a, a blueberry outfit. I think this is one of those trends in agriculture in the UK that I per perceive that I have been seeing blueberries mentioned quite a lot and different techniques to make them successful and economically viable in Britain. But the fun part about this is the computer vision part. So there's a bit of a grant, a knowledge exchange grant that the engineers have, and they have been working for a um, for a uh, ripeness identification tool for these guys. And I'm going to go and see the site myself. I even have thought of the ideas of a, a field trip. So Matt's going to tell us about that um next week and we'll ask him about whether a, a field trip for the r group to see the um, computer vision tooling and process is possible um a week after that now i see megan in the chat and i don't see claire um is that i've asked uh, those guys to think about doing a github branch and merge session we, we had a couple of github sessions recently it's a tool that it's not just for programmers anymore. All sorts of scientists are using it because it's it's free and it's a um, very becoming much easier to use. And uh, we're going to talk about a, a slightly more advanced than just bare bones beginners tool, but it, it's one of the basic things you do when you're collaborating. Uh, so you have some code and some data and you're maybe producing an analysis for a paper or your thesis or something. And uh, we're going to understand what branching and merging is and how you can use it as a tool to collaborate. So that's the next couple of weeks. We'll be looking for some volunteers. And if I don't get any volunteers, I think um, in a few weeks, a thing I've been doing with Claire is uh, I wrote some code to automate a big um, dump of weather data. And I think I'll I'll talk about that research we've been doing lately still looking for volunteers always welcome after that all right so if you want to follow along today the topic of effects i already have the slides up so um let's bring those up now we'll um what i'm going to do with this is i'm going to present this as a talk to introduce the the idea of effect size and uh, if we have time left over at the end depending on how much time we have um, I've picked out an empirical paper that that we can use to talk about the um, the you know practicality of extracting an effect size from the literature. Why might we want to do this, and what is effect size? Well, that's the topic of uh, what these slides are about. Um, just before the meeting, Martin came in and said that uh, anything with effect size he's interested in, and that reminds me to uh, to offer that if if people are interested in this practical tool of the effect size, um, it it is a very simple topic to grasp and understand, but there are some some details to it that make the learning curve um, a little steep to do some of the the more advanced things. And I would argue that, understanding and being able to fluently speak about effect size for your own research is uh, something that is so valuable and it will give you the edge over other people and, and including it will give you the edge uh, for publishing publishing your work and um, talking to other people whether they're your supervisors or external examiners or internal examiners or whomever you may speak to it will give you a big advantage because it's a very powerful concept okay so what the first part of this talk is is simply what is effect size. And um, I want to introduce this idea that I call um, effect size thinking. Now, the idea of effect size thinking is um, something that um, that is a way, it's a framework to think about your own data 
and to think about it in in context of uh, of things you may want to talk to other people about it. So what what is the effect size? Well, this thing that we call the effect effect size is just a quantitative measure of the magnitude of some phenomenon that's in your data. And let's say in the in the simplest case, it may be something like um, we, we could have an effect size for, um, ooh, this is drawing really slow. Maybe we have an effect size for two means where we have uh, categories A and B. And uh, we made a box plot of these. The, the effect size would be a quantification of how big this difference is. So that's a way to think about it. Another way to think of effect size, different kind of effect size, and I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, is if you had some data that are two quantitative variables and there was a correlation between them, a way to think of the effect size for that kind of data is, um, is the correlation coefficient. Okay, so we'll talk about both of those basic two different kinds of effect size. And of course, there are variations on all different statistical models. This is one of the complexities of effect size thinking. Why do you care about effect size? Well, it, it provides um, excess information to a simplistic thing like a p-value. So p-value only gives us a yes or no. Is there a, uh, an effect size that's, that's different to zero? But if we actually talk about the quantification of the effect size, we, we really have a bigger depth of knowledge. We can say not only that um, it's different to zero, but we can say how relatively big it is um, to compare phenomenon. If you have an experiment with more than one treatment and a control, then uh, you can use the relative effect size to compare your two treatments to each other and to the control. This is, this is again, different than just comparing the means with a post-hoc test. That's just yes or no. Are they different? Is the difference greater than zero? This is a way to quantify that difference. Now, um, I'm going to use this little tool. I have to um, turn it off every time and turn it back on. So we'll see if I can keep up with that. But why does effect size matter? Well, it uh, it matters because it it gives us insight into um, not just into significance like the like the p-value might, but uh, what we might call the practical significance. So this this is going above and beyond mere statistical significance. Um, this is an important um, concept. I think I will bring up my little tool for this one. This this um, mere statistical um, significance just tells us whether there is an effect, but the real world impact is something different. And if I redraw my little my little um, a little diagram here and my little cartoon of what an effect size is, what this real world impact allows us to evaluate is uh, for for this quantity, the effect size, we, we know that it's it's real and it exists. But um, biologically, do we care about it? Is it big enough to to care about? So um, I was just literally um, less than an hour ago. I completed a a power analysis. If you've heard of power analysis, it it's a tool to um, to uh, determine uh, what your sample size should be in an experiment to meet a minimum standard for best practice and to calculate. Um, power for an experiment, we must also calculate the effect size. And uh, a way to think about this is that if you have an expectation of an effect size um, here, that um, it, it has to be big enough uh, in, in practical magnitude for us to care about the phenomenon biologically. So the one that I was working on a little bit earlier was about um, how protein content in milk is impacted by um, by foods with different carbohydrates. There's a long explanation of why this experiment is interesting to people, but um, there the um, 
the reason to to alter that has to do with um, making the bioavailability of micronutrients that that um, cows need uh, when they're producing a lot of milk um, uh, to to improve that in their diets. But a knock on effect is that it reduces the amount of um, of protein in the milk by a very very small amount. So we can ask if we if we were to calculate the effect size for that experiment where there's a control and there's a, a starch treatment, we can ask if this difference in um, in something that we measure, I've drawn it the opposite direction because it's actually a reduction in in um, protein in the milk that it causes. We can actually ask if the effect size is big enough for us to actually care uh, about whether that uh, that matters for us. Another big reason about effect size is that uh, we can we can use effect sizes to compare results between different studies. Uh, I don't know. Can I just take a micro survey in the chat? Uh, how many of you have heard of meta analysis? Just put a one if you've heard of meta analysis and a zero if it's kind of a new thing and you don't really know what it is. Do you know what meta analysis is? Put a one or a zero in the chat. It's a it's a little mix. Some people have um, have heard about it. This is kind of a um, you know I guess in the scheme of things for statistics, meta analysis is relatively new. It has been around for some number of years, twenty years or something, and it's very popular at the moment. But it, it is relatively new with respect to um, the 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 whole population of statistical knowledge. What it is, is it entails, um, if you're interested in some phenomenon, and the phenomenon could be any phenomenon in science where a number of, of studies have been published, um, it involves collecting and harvesting the effect sizes in different papers. And um, because, because they are a standard measure of, of some phenomenon, um, of the magnitude of some phenomenon, what meta-analysis does is it allow, allows us to correct for all the differences for all the studies in terms of sample size and um, in terms of variation and in terms of um, even in terms of the authors or the maybe the animal or human populations that the study's done in allows us to statistically correct for all of that stuff and and come up with a a single um, a single answer for many, many studies that is uh, statistically valid for for evidence for some phenomenon. Um, in some fields, it's really popular, uh, like in human medical biology, it's really popular. But in other fields, um, there are a lot of opportunities, and agriculture is one of those. There's a lot of opportunities to perform meta-analysis. Um, Nikki Randall <coughs> here at Harper, uh, is interested in uh, what what she might refer to as uh, evidence um, evidence generation, and that often entails reviewing the qualitative or in the meta analysis case uh, the quantitative information and formally performing a meta analysis. I have only engaged in one meta analysis since I've been at Harper, and that was with uh, Claire Muniello. And it was a comparison of um, human diets and the um, the effectiveness of human diets uh, that are that are similar by diet in different populations. Okay, so these are the really the two reasons why we care. The practical significance is just a basic science one, and the comparison across different studies is is for essentially for meta analysis. Oh, I'm having this little issue again where um, my little tool is um, is creating a problem. Frozen up. Can you guys still hear me okay? Can somebody uh, tell yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah can you can hear me. Yeah, All right, yeah, just, you're just fine. My... It's just, uh, just your tool, Ed. Just my screen. Okay, let me stop sharing and I'll reshare.
<clears throat> I'm going to stop using this tool. I, I had hopes of using it because it, it is convenient in some ways. There we go. Oh, no, it's just the little tool has crashed. There we go. Resharing now. There we go. All right, we're going to have to do without the scribbling notes that I love to make. So, um, all right, so there are, um, as I've already mentioned, there are different types of effect sizes. I often say that there are two main types. Um, one that I, I drew a cartoon of was um, Cohen's D. And um, I'm not going to draw the little picture again because I'm not going to risk my tool. But uh, Cohen's D is used when you compare means in um, in two groups. It's the simplest application of Cohen's D, but uh, you can um, generalize it to uh, to any linear model with um, continuous and categorical variables. Um, and we'll look at what the requirements are for calculating Cohen's D in a second. Um, Pearson's R is another. Um, effect size and that has to do with measuring the strength between two quantitative variables so um, that's also very easy this is the easiest of all effect sizes it comes a little more complicated when you have multiple variables and you want to come up with a coherent um, um, accumulative effect size but there are many methods to do that and they're they're straightforward these days as long as you have a toolbox at your command to do so there is actually a third kind of effect size. It's um, it's not so common in the kind of um, kind of research that that people tend to do here at Harper. At least I've never um, encountered anybody interested in in calculating the odds ratio. But uh, this is a one that's particular for logistic regression or data that have ones and zeros. It's a very mainstream and robust. Um, kind of question to ask, and uh, I'll talk you through a detailed example in a second, but in essence, if um, it's used a lot in, um, especially in pharmaceutical studies, whether they're human, and they actually are used in the vet um, medical um, veterinary literature as well for, for animal um, clinical trials. What the odds ratio is, is it looks at the, um, the odds of, uh, of being say sick or well for uh, for a particular treatment with a particular drug, and as opposed to the odds of being sick or well um, in a control group that didn't receive that or received a placebo, and it's a way to um, compare and, and quantify the efficacy um, of of drugs or some treatment for some outcome that is binary. So uh, live, die, um, grow or not grow, or so forth. So we'll look at these examples in turn. Now, um, now I do want my drawing tool here. I think I will risk it for this slide. We'll give it one more chance. Maybe I was drawing too much with it. It didn't like that. It got tired. So uh, one of the reasons I want to draw on this slide is I've forgotten to put the um, definitions of these variables here. So um, this is the formula to express Cohen's D um, to compare the difference between two means. And um, what the M is for on this equation, you can see it's a very simple equation. It's just uh, two means divided by a standard deviation. So uh, what these means are, are the means of the two groups or uh, for which you want to calculate the effect size. And uh, this pooled standard deviation is the standard deviation of those two groups. Um, I'm not going to go into the technical detail of the pooled part, but suffice it to say that um, if, the, if the sample size is the same for both of those means that you've calculated, then the standard deviation, the pooled standard deviation is just the average standard deviation. Um, the pooled part, uh, we need to adjust if the sample sizes are, are different, which they often are. So it's just a, a simple calculation. So we get this, um, this quantity D, which is our effect size for any 
two comparisons that we wish to make. Well, um, I don't know if you can see, but I'll, I'll unshare my camera just um, a second so you can see my, just see myself and that uh, I can show you, uh, now my, my background is um, blurring. Let me turn that off. Oh, wow, what a good idea it seems like when you turn on the backwards part. There we go. Does that look backwards for everybody or does it just look backwards for me? No, it's backwards for you. I can read that perfectly. Oh, that's yeah. good. All right. So this this book by Jacob Cohen is sort of the Bible of um, of power analysis. So I I got this as a statistics PhD student, read it, um, took a a class that lasted a whole year, um, but I, I've used it. I've kept it to hand my entire career. It still is the um, the Bible of power analysis. In in this book that this guy wrote, um, it, it essentially introduces the idea of these simple um, these simple effect sizes, but expands the use case for these effect sizes to all sorts of linear models. Now, I don't recognize, recommend it for um, for most applied scientists to actually get get a hold of Jacob Cohn's book. And the reason that I that I showed it to you is to explain this interpretation bit down here at the bottom, and to tell you where it came from from that book. So, uh, Jacob Cohn's known for for two things in his career. He he was actually not a statistician, but he was a very quantitative psychologist. And uh, one of the things he's known for is um, is a review paper that reviewed the statistical power in the psychology literature. This was many years ago, 30 years ago. And what he what he demonstrated was that the statistical power in published studies was often very low. And uh, he suggested in this famous paper that uh, that there was bias in the publication process where um, papers that were statistically significant showed su statistical significance for some phenomenon that is, um, but had very low statistical power, were much more likely to be published than, um, than um, papers that uh, differed, differed from that, that state, that had more power or were not significant. And his point was that uh, we should be performing statistical power for every experiment before we start collecting data. And he also suggested a rule of thumb for effect sizes. Uh, and for Cohen's D, the rule of thumb that he gave us were, um, were these. I'm just going to remove that for a second and say that um, if you perform this calculation, that uh, if you come out with a 0.2 or near, that uh, he just as a rule of thumb would consider that a small effect size. And the, the, also, he, he, these are just subjective. And yet, he did base this empirically on surveying the literature for lots of papers. Um, that 0.5 was a medium size effect size, and 0.8 was a large effect size. You can see from this equation. That, um, Ed, excuse me. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, we, we can't see your slide. It was on oh. the bottom of the slide. I don't know if oh, you're okay. talking to it specifically. Sorry right. about that. I, I unshared to show you that Jacob Cohen's book in, in physical form. I'm sorry about that. No problem. See it now. Ah, so um, I was just pointing out the, um, the interpretation of Cohen's um, equation and that when D is small, by Cohen's rule of thumb, um, it uh, it is around 0 0.2, 0 0.5 for medium, and 0.8 for a large effect size. And you can see from the equation that the difference between means will scale according to how big the variation is. This is this is if you think about it. Um, I, I hope that it seems intuitive to you. I just turn back on my, I just turn back on my uh, little drawing device here again. 
that uh, if we had two situations which had uh, identical means, for case one and case two, that uh, assume that these are that this quantity, this difference, is the numerator for this equation. But then I were to say, if these were box plots and I were to draw the range, uh, and let's say that this isn't the range, it's, it's actually a measure of the um, standard deviation. And I'm going to draw these much bigger than the other box. What we'd see is that the standard deviation is small for uh, this case A over here. And uh, that would mean the standard deviation pooled was uh, going to be small, which would mean the calculation of D would be would be larger. Whereas if the um, variation is larger, D will be smaller. And uh, this is kind of a satisfying way to think about um, this difference. If, if you have a difference, even if the difference itself is exactly the same, it will re result in a smaller effect size if the variation is big. This is very intuitive, um, but this this rule of thumb that people find very compelling, it's also a bit controversial because it doesn't fit. You still have to uh, use your brain, some people might say. Um, the other one that I mentioned that is very common is Pearson's R. Um, this comes from Pearson, this famous statistician. Um, who invented Pearson's correlation, the, the normal parametric correlation that all of us use all the time. And uh, it was Jacob Cohen that suggested that Pearson's R could also be used as a um, as an effect size. The range of R is uh, from minus one to plus one, but the interpretation is the absolute magnitude of um, you know, ignoring the, the minus sign the the minus sign for negative little r's um, shows us the difference between a negative correlation or a positive correlation, of course. But uh, the interpretation of the uh, effect size for r is just the absolute magnitude. Now, note the rule of thumb is different here. The uh, rule of thumb for r is uh, that it's a it, point 0.1 little r is a small effect size. 0.3, according to J Cohen's rules of thumb, is medium, and 0.5 is large. Um, you might, you might um, disagree. Depends on what field you're in. And some people have disagreed with some of these rules of thumb. And yet, they're still in wide use. I, I use them all the time, and everyone that I know who does power analysis does too. I wanted to show you um, this picture and talk you through it and maybe spend enough time on it to, to have everybody understand it. Because um, th this comes from um, a paper that is a, a paper introducing the concept of effect size to, uh, to biologists. And uh, what you have here on the on the uh, x-axis down here are are correlation coefficients, little r's, of different magnitude. And each one of the dots is a simulated study for um, a population parameter or a particular correlation coefficient. And what you see is the the uh, mean estimate is the dot for each of these simulated studies, and the error bars is the 95% confidence interval around them. And a way to interpret this is that if the whiskers overlap this, this dotted line, which is on zero, then, um, then um, we, we would typically conclude that we, we can't, we can't, value the mean as being different to zero because um, 
because it, it will overlap zero, our estimate of it, where it actually is, the true mean will um, lie within this range with 95% confidence. So um, that's a long way of saying that if the if the stick goes over zero, it's not different to zero. <laughs> what is on the y-axis here is the interesting thing. Um, it shows the the effect of different sample sizes. I've just highlighted these two for now. If we just uh, kind of have a look at these, um, for these two, this compares a p-value of 0.5 for both of these cases for two different sample sizes. This one is 200, and this one is 20. Now, um, neither of these um, small correlation coefficients are estimated to be different to zero. But uh, look at the effect that sample size has on the size of the whiskers. On the uh, the one that that is um, uh, here with a sample size of just 20, the whiskers are huge. Uh, and the one with, uh, with a sample size of 200, the whiskers are very small, yet it's, it's so small that it, it overlaps zero. As we go up, this uh, and look at different p-values, these top p-values are highly significant and uh, the sample sizes are different and we still see the effect of, um, of the size of the variation and we see some intermediate cases as well. If you read the paper that this is from, I have the citation I'll, I'll point you to later. I, I do recommend, recommend um, people to read this paper um, you'll see that uh, different magnitudes of correlation coefficient were, were simulated in this, just as an example. The point here is that the, um, the effect size for Pearson's R changes as a function of sample size, and um, we, we can't ignore that in this, and it just frames, frames the mind for thinking about it. So this is analogous to the variation being bigger or smaller for Cohen's D. Now, the odds ratio is a funny one because it isn't um, used a lot in agriculture and ecology. It, um, as I tried to explain before, it's the, it's the odds of one event occurring compared um, to the, uh, the, the same event occurring in some different group. Often this is an experiment where um, where the uh, numerators would be one group subject um, to one treatment, and the denominator would be a different group subject to a different treatment, like like a placebo and a drug and a drug experiment. Now, uh, what what these are, what the actual values here are, is um, a is just a count of a number of events. Um, that happened in group one. And uh, this is a funny way to say it. Um, now that I look at it, even I think it's a funny way that I've written here, is that it's the number of non-events. But what I really mean is that it's the number of um, the the other case. So if, if this is the number of times um, a patient got sick, this is the number of times the patient got well. Uh, and so forth. And this is just the same the same counts in a different group. okay, and it's the it's the relative odds of of um, getting well or staying sick for these two different treatments that's used um, in the calculation of this odds ratio. Now the odds ratio itself, the OR, is considered to be an effect size. Um, and we, we interpret this in a way where um, if the if the ratio is the same, the odds of, let's say, with that example, being sick or well, if there's no difference between the two conditions, um, then the odds ratio will be about one. But if the odds ratio is greater than one, that means the event is more likely in the first group. Maybe it means that the drug is efficacious. And if the odds ratio is less than one, that means the event's less likely in the first group. 
may, maybe in the worst case scenario means there's an adverse effect in the drug, something like that. And uh, there are lots of statistics, whole books, and e even whole whole fields of study around the odds ratio. But I'm not going to mention that anymore because we don't use it very much. Okay, so um, that brings me to this point that the different fields have different um, standards for interpreting effect size, and they also have have different standards for um, for reporting effect size. And um, to give you an example of what I mean, in um, in the medical literature, if you're publishing the results of a of a clinical trial, it would be un, uh, unthinkable to attempt to either to propose a clinical trial or to publish your findings from a clinical trial without um, being explicit and publishing the effect size and and all of the um, the uh, summary statistics and information that leads up to the to the um, calculation of the effect size. In other fields, um, and an, an example is um, like the study I was working on earlier, uh, it's in animal physiology. And in that, that field, reporting the effect size is very rare. You would rarely see it. And uh, to have a license on the, on, um, on the farm where we can do research with animals, you're required to minimize minimize the number of animals that you subject to research conditions for ethical reasons, and um, and yet uh, the tool that we could use, the power analysis and effect size, um, to to reduce that number to the very lowest, where where we're not wasting our time, where we could still could detect the effect we're interested in, it is not standard practice. So uh, those are extremes. Human medical field versus a, a field that that finds um, finds uh, the importance of good statistical design. It's essential. It's even a legal, legally essential um, thing. But reporting the effect size is, is very rare. All right. So different fields have different standards for interpretation. But whatever field you have, you must have domain knowledge to interpret um, really what a large effect size is. So back to that milk example I mentioned, if 0.05% uh, of uh, milk protein difference is important or not, that's the question. And you probably will need to know something about milk production and, and milk physiology to be able to have a strong opinion about that. Sounds like a small amount, but uh, with the the homogeneity of genetic strains for cows and um, standard management practices and very tight margins on a large scale with lots of milk, that's a lot less protein in 10,000 kilograms of milk. So <clears throat> this is one of the things that um, you need to have, to have the most powerful interpretation of, of, um, of effect size. Another thing we need to know, we must know the sample size. Uh, and believe it or not, this is sometimes hard, as we may see if we have time to look at the, the example paper I chose. Um, we must consider sample size. We must know what the sample size is, and we must um, we must uh, work with sample sizes that are feasible because we cannot work with ones that are infeasible. So um, we know, just as a matter of statistical fact, that smaller sample sizes will be less accurate in, in estimating variability. So just like the graph I showed, um, small sample sizes will have a huge variance, and we won't, we won't be able to detect a, uh, a small mean difference, for example. Another one is the study design. Um, different experimental designs are, they have different levels of efficiency to exploit some sample size and to detect an effect size. A little example of that, um, and maybe I'll just turn back on the uh, pin for a moment. A little example of that uh, might be a, a Latin square study where um, you have some number of um, 
of treatments in a, in a design like this. And the question is, how many subjects do I need to put in each set of treatments? And then in a Latin squares design, maybe we have a, a control, an A treatment, a B treatment, and a C treatment. And in each of these rows, we might have a different um, order to these treatments. I'm not going to go into more technical details about this, but the Latin squares design is very famous for um, being very efficient and having high statistical power relative to um, to uh, other kinds of designs. If you can just see over my shoulder that picture right there, it's a picture of a guy who's been dead for a while, but um, he's the one that wrote about Latin squares quite a lot and use them at Rothamsted Research quite a lot. And sorry, Fisher. Let me just close this real quick. There we go. Now, uh, I think this is one of my last slides, and it's reporting effect sizes. And we'll, we'll look at a paper in a second that does not report effect size. But let me just say, um, say very plainly that best practice is reporting your effect size as an as a result of itself. Um, every paper should, in my opinion, no matter what field it is, report the descriptive summary statistics, the sample size, including means and standard deviations, uh, and, and even the calculation of the effect size. If everybody did that, it would make most of the work of meta-analysis, and that, that is the most efficient use of scientific information uh, that we know of at the moment. Um, it would make it very easy, but actually performing meta-analysis is very hard because a lot of times complete reporting of um, the basic summary statistics is, is not present in many, many papers. All right, so... Um, the best practice dictates that we we would report the explicit magnitude of your effect size. Um, maybe not every one that's possible, but at least the ones that are that are aligned to your principal hypotheses. That we um, report the the um, confidence interval around that effect size estimate. So the ninety five percent confidence interval, for example. And uh, and also a subject specific interpretation of um, of that effect size and explain you know the effect size is x that lines up with uh, you know Cohen's rules of thumb like this but biologically here's how important I think it is um, and, and especially in the context of your study so sometimes as a reviewer I have uh, commented on this and suggested authors provide effect sizes, but in some fields, it, it is not yet common, but uh, it is becoming more common in all fields. I've, I've put up uh, and I've talked all along about the benefits. Um, I think getting into thinking about the effect size really, especially for early career scientists is Im important. It's a, it's a tool that you can apply to every piece of research, either that you conduct yourself or that you read about in the paper. And it is just a lever that enhances your understanding. Um, a big reason to get into effect size thinking, though, is that it, it, um, it helps with decision making. For scientists, the decision making might be, um, what's the next experiment? Or should I even do this experiment? Or yeah, I think of effect sizes are the kind of tool that if we could somehow communicate them to different stakeholders, not just scientists, even even farmers and agronomists uh, in, in the fields that a lot of you guys do research in, that it would make a big difference because um, it's such a simple concept that you could compare um, the gain you get in, say, milk yield with the reduction you get in, say, protein content of your milk. And so for for really just a, as a practical tool, it, it can support many kinds of decisions for many different stakeholders. This meta-analysis one is 
I, I, had, I had mixed reactions of people who've never done a meta analysis before about this, but um, you know, you might think, uh, oh, meta analysis, yeah, I don't, that doesn't sound very nice to me. I'm probably not going to do it. You may never do a meta analysis, but um, even if you don't, a way of thinking about reporting effect sizes and making making them available for some future meta analysis, even if somebody else does it, is that um, it is a small advancement of science that we're all capable of if if you publish any study that you ever do. Some people would go further and argue, some people have gone further and argued that it's your responsibility to uh, facilitate meta-analyses because it makes the most efficient use of, of public money that, uh, that funds science. Um, but whether or not you are a civic-minded scientist or um, or maybe you're just interested in in using meta-analysis, you probably should uh, be reporting those um, and, and have in the back of your mind that meta-analysis is a is a another kind of output that can make your research even more valuable. Yeah, so this is important stuff. Um, and it goes beyond statistical significance and has biological real meaning. Mentioned that I would give a few references. Um, sometimes I like to ask people how many references a paper should have before it's, a, you know, very, and th that was attempted air quotes, in a very important paper. I like to I like to do this um, quite a lot when I'm talking to students who are beginning doing technical writing, and I I, I ask them, uh, you know, how many do you think a paper, how many citations, a paper should have of itself before you consider it to be very important. And I like to start the conversation, start the bidding at about um, you know 50 scientific citations. 50 citations. So if you you think 50 citations for some paper, that means that um, 50 other scientists have deemed some paper, maybe it's a paper that you wrote, but about 50 scientists have noticed, have read, and have taken the trouble to uh, paraphrase and cite evidence that you produced in their paper. You know, you have to. Every paper starts somewhere. Every paper starts with zero. So uh, if you get to 50, maybe that's a milestone. But you know, a lot of papers have 50. So so maybe maybe it's an okay paper that somebody has noticed. But maybe you want to have a hundred before you, you know you think it's nah, that's a pretty good paper. Um, you know, but there are papers that have more than a hundred. There are papers that have a thousand. Now, when you get to a paper that has a thousand citations, we're talking about a paper that a lot of people care about, a lot of people are interested in, a lot of people cite. This is very popular for a scientific paper. If, if you want to think about this, you can just play for yourself. Google some keywords in Google Scholar, and one of the uh, fields that you'll see is how many citations a paper has. Now, why do I tell you about this? Um, it's because I want to I want to underscore the importance of a couple of these papers. I, I've only given you three papers here to read. This paper up here is relatively new. Um, it's in the journal Trends in Ecology and Evolution, which is a fantastic journal. Um, it, you may think that um, tree or trends in ecology and evolution is uh, maybe it, it's not for you because you work on crop studies or other things, but I I almost guarantee you that in every issue of Tree, you'll find something that is related to your research and interesting uh, in, in agriculture. It, it is aimed at ecology and evolution, but um, it's a it's a review journal. Tends to get a lot of citations. Now there's a phenomenon by just using the number of citations in a journal that's related to when a journal article was published. So if it's very new, it will not have time to have accrued a lot of, um, of citations. But I, I read this paper recently, 
It's called Addressing Context Dependence in Ecology. And I, I think it's a future classic paper. It has a few hundred citations at the moment, uh, I think. But it, um, it really explains why we should do effect size thinking for um, both experiments, but, but importantly for observational data like ecologists have a lot, and importantly like, like agriculture biologists have a lot too. So th this one is an important paper, which I just I recently read, thought it was very interesting, and um, I have suggested it to other people to read. Now, this paper, uh, Shinichi Nakagawa is a mate of mine. I've known him for a really long time, and he loves writing papers. He's a very good statistician, and he loves writing papers about statistics for non-statisticians, and he's very, very good at it. Uh, this paper is, uh, I think, a classic. It's um, effect size, confidence intervals, and statistical significance, a practical guide for biologists. I think this is essential reading for PhD students who are in applied non-math, non-stats backgrounds. This one has about 3.5K citations. So, you know, it's up there. It's pretty good. A lot of people think this paper is a big deal, a gift that Nakagawa has is, is writing very clearly about technical concepts. So I recommend, recommend this Nakagawa paper, but it's, um, it's this paper that it's a, bit of an, it's a bit of an advance. It goes beyond what we talked about today. And it, it's about, um, it's about um, obtaining effect sizes for generalized linear mixed models. Um, you know, and one way of measuring the effect size is the R squared, which is a, a measure of the amount of um, of um, of uh, variance that your model explains, and it's it's one of the quantities that you have to you have to calculate before you can do a formal formal power analysis for generalized linear mixed models. Now, this one, the last time I checked, had close to ten thousand. A little bit less than 10,000 citations. This is an astonishing paper. 10,000 citations is a must read. And I really recommend uh, PhD students also, and other interesting people who are interested in this subject and haven't read it yet. You must read this paper. Um, this one is great as well because there's an R package that, uh, that Shinichi wrote or calculating R squared, and I use it all the time uh, for doing power analysis. I, I just used it earlier today, uh, as a matter of fact. I think that's my last slide. We I have rambled on much longer than I thought. I, I thought there might be time for some coding, but maybe um, maybe I'll just open for questions if anybody has any comments or questions. And and maybe the one thing I will ask that we could talk about is whether, if there's interest, that we could go on for some uh, more empirical sessions on effect size, maybe things like looking into a paper and calculating the effect size, or um, using a published paper as a pilot data to do a power analysis for an experiment that, that you want to do, or you know, calculating the effect size for a, a linear model that's more complicated than just comparing two means or or the correlation. So if there's interest in that, I would love to do it. This is one of my favorite topics. What, what do we think? That's all I have. <laughs> um, I think that, that would be a good idea. I will be up for, for that for some practical. I think that um, it when I see the reporting that people do in for the animal ethics committee, um, even people that are very good and very good scientists and report things, they're uncomfortable with the idea of power analysis. And I, I have uh, tried to think of a way to provide some guidelines that are palatable for people, for the minimum standard to report. Um, but almost all of the Almost all of the um, 
the experiments that go through there are fairly complicated. A lot of Latin squares and repeated measures, so they're they're linear mixed effects models, and it it's not trivial. So I thought maybe there would be some interest in doing that here. Ed, if I may make a comment, um, it's really interesting. Thank you, as always. You, you mentioned about um, effect size and being picked up by farmers and agronomists. So that that sort of um, you know struck a chord with me, being on the agronomy side of things. Yeah. Um, and thinking about one of your slides where you were thinking about um, effect size and uh, and um, uh, p values, so you know I've I've always wondered whether we should think about effect size more than just thinking about um, what I'm going to call an, an arbitrary probability value of 0 0.05. You know, if if I'm talking, let's say, for example, you know, the effect size looks really good. But the probability tells us that it's not real. But if the probability value is 0.06, and the resultant effect size would would be not just biologically meaningful, as you said, but financially meaningful, you know, should that be something that that we take account of rather than just dismiss a scientist because it you know it hasn't reached the probability value that we arbitrarily work to? Yeah, uh, this is a great point, Martin. Um, th this is that case that you're talking about on this graph, where uh, there, there probably is something there, and it, it relates to the concept of power. Um, if you have one, I think there are a couple of ways that agronomists and even even farmers uh, could be interested in, in this as a tool. Um, w one case is the case like you're talking about, where there's some evidence, but the p-value tells us that if we interpret it mindlessly, that we have to throw it, throw away that evidence. It's, not, it's valueless. So one way we could use it is it's a, it calibrates how we interpret it. And just as you say, if this is the 95% confidence interval with a small sample size, um, it's still very likely that that effect size is greater than zero, and there probably is some value there. And a thing that I might do um, as a statistician is I might ask, um, well, if our sample size is very low, we probably have very low statistical power <laughs> to start with. And if it's important enough, um, yeah, there's probably something there to it. An another thing it does, though, is like I'm thinking of, um, I see a lot of field trials conducted. And a, th a thing that I thought of is the Within one field trial, there's often so many different um, different comparisons that are being made at, at the same time that, I mean, from a purely statistical design standpoint, it, it's a little bit like shooting yourself in the foot. Because if, if you were expending the same effort, you could focus on the ones you're most interested in and have stronger statistical power. But on the other hand, I, I know there are reasons why companies um, have a lot of um, comparisons in field trials, and sometimes they have. Re they're often beyond just science. Uh, they maybe there's a marketing um, angle to it and things like that. And uh, if you used effect size, what you could do is you, you rather than doing those post hoc comparisons, the effect size tells you how efficacious a particular treatment is, and, and it, it's a number that you can compare to any other treatment. But the best thing about it is that I, I have often thought of, I haven't done a, a load of them, but in the old days of CERT, the, uh, the, the office, which we shall not name anymore, I don't know what it's even called now, but in the old days of CERT, I did a few analyses for Grace when she was the um, trials person there. And um, I, I thought sometimes that um, we're doing a field trial this year, but I just did one six months ago that was very similar and there was some overlap. And if we had a database of effect sizes from different trials, it would be like the ultimate um, the ultimate catalog of knowledge for, for an actual agronomist. 
independent of a company. So I have thought that it, it also gives that just that basic tool. It's one of the basic uses of effect sizes that, um, that they probably would be interesting if we could just find a way to organize the information and get the word out. Um, I was talking, well, Eric and Megan were in a meeting with me this morning. If, if I say another word about this to you, Martin, we were in a meeting with um, some people from uh, all over. The, it's a agri-statistics group that I started with some friends at Rothamsted and other places, and we're trying to grow the group, and we have meetings every once in a while. And um, one of the things that I talked about with, we do breakout rooms and I, in my breakout room uh, I talked to somebody who has uh, been working on um, collecting a, a database of data sets in, in agronomy and um, Megan and I and Eric as well have been thinking about doing something like that here and uh, I think that for field trials they're, they're a good case study. I don't even know how many field trials we do. Do we do them a lot every year? I'm not sure there's as many going on at the moment as there have historically. Yeah. I just, I just, um, I, I even this morning thought, gosh, there's no time like the present to start just, just keeping in some kind of simple format a, a way to make it easy for the trials officer to, um, to keep track of that basic information so we have a reference that that's probably that's probably good for a meta analysis or two if we had a database like that <laughs> um that's all i've got any any other comments yes i would like to to follow on on martin's uh, comment about